Okay, welcome. Good afternoon. I'm Katherine Clark, and um, it's such a pleasure for me to welcome you to the UCLA Department of Chemistry and Biochemistry Distinguished Lecture Series. As you may know, once per quarter, we stop our very exciting and vigorous specialized seminar series to take an opportunity for all of us to come together to celebrate the incredible breadth and depth of the science that is practiced in our department. And to do this, we invite speakers whose scientific contributions extend across traditional boundaries and address many of the most exciting and challenging problems and opportunities we face. So our distinguished professor, guest speaker this winter quarter is Professor David Baker, who will be introduced by one of our own distinguished professors, David Eisenberg. Kathy, thank you for giving me the honor of introducing David Baker. Uh, David comes to us from the University of Washington, where he is the director and I think the founder, the, the light, the leading light of the Institute of Protein Design. And he is also the director of the Rosetta Commons, which is the outfit which produces the wonderful software known as Rosetta that many of us use here at UCLA and is used around the world. I think it's fair to say it's virtually a revolution in macromolecular energetics. It, it works. <laughs> what sort of background does such a leader have? Well, David was a graduate student in biochemistry and cell biology in the laboratory of Randy Sheckman, uh, of course a UCLA graduate, where he, he worked on vesicular traffic. And then as a postdoctoral fellow, he was at UC San Francisco, where he did structural biology in the lab of David Agard, working on alpha-lytic protease, with, and framed the answer to the problem of how alpha-lytic protease folds and operates in a, a, a brilliant thermodynamic uh, structure. Uh, and then going to the University of Washington, then he turns out to be a software writer and engineer and working out the potentials for protein interactions. He's also a reader, compulsive reader. When I asked him in one of his visits to UCLA, what do you think the structures of denatured or denaturing proteins are? He answered uh, by paraphrasing Tolstoy. He said, every happy protein is the same, but all unhappy proteins are unhappy in their own way. <laughs> and uh, I understood what he meant. Uh, today, David is going to speak on the coming age of de novo protein design. And I have to say, we'd like to feel that we're the magnet that brought him to UCLA, but I think it was his daughter, who's a UCLA uh, graduate student, sitting in the front row. All right, well, thank you, David, for that very nice introduction. And um, it's always nice to come back to uh, UCLA and see old friends. And it's particularly, it's particularly nice this time to see Amanda. And I pro as I promised Amanda, I'll have a lot of pictures of her during my talk. So you'll get to see her <laughs> at all stages of um, development. Um, <laughs> we've had a lot of exciting interchanges about this over the last month. So, um, so let's see. But before I get to those, um, uh, I need to explain the title of my talk. Um, in uh, our, our early ancestors, when they wanted to make new things to solve the problems that they faced, looked around in the world around them, and this is what the world looked like to people living in caves, or it's supposed to, I suppose, and they, they, they found things in the environment, and they shaped them into primitive tools. They carved bones and sharpened sticks and so forth. Um, and of course, that's not the way that human technology works today. Um, you can try and make um, uh, something that flies and carries people by taking birds and trying to modify them, but you wouldn't get very far. Um, and of course, the way that we make airplanes and so forth in computers is by starting from first principles understanding and then building, uh, building um, 
for example, things that satisfy the laws of aerodynamics. Now, in the biological realm, that's, we're still kind of in the Stone Age. Um, so when protein people, when you want, people want new proteins, by and large, what they do is they look around in the natural environment uh, that, uh, um, you know, around us, that's the natural world, um, and they take, um, uh, they, they take proteins that are similar to what they want and then, and then modify them a little bit. So it's sort of in this, sort of the, the kind of the Stone Age technology sort of thing. And what I'm going to tell you about today is sort of a, a, a new approach. Rather than building, making, building proteins by taking things that exist and tweaking them a little bit, instead um, uh, building proteins from the ground up from first principles. And um, we can't make proteins that fly yet, but or can. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, that's right, that's right. But they're they're the they're like the old school. That's old school technology, of course. Yeah. Um, <laughs> All right, and so the, the two problems I'm going to tell you about are first the, um, the, the biology problem, which is, uh, of course, we have genes in our genomes which encode amino acid sequences, and the protein folding problem is how do you go from the amino acid sequence of a protein to the three-dimensional structure of the protein, and that's the protein structure prediction problem. And the inverse problem is um, uh, taking brand new protein structures that don't exist and working backwards to identify amino acid sequences that uh, fold up to those structures. Let's see. The basic concept that underlies all of, everything I'm going to tell you about is that proteins fold to their lowest free energy states in general. Um, and so in the, the structure prediction problem, uh, the we have a fixed amino acid sequence. And the, and, uh, the challenge is to search through the possible states for that, pro that protein sequence, that pro possible structures that protein could have for the, that which has lowest energy. Uh, the protein design problem instead is we, um, we want to make a up a completely new structure to solve a new problem, and we need to find a sequence which has the property that that new structure is the lowest energy state for that sequence. And as David mentioned, over the years we've developed a program called Rosetta, which um, has uh, uh, methods for algorithms for searching through the space of possible structures, searching through the space of possible sequences, and evaluating energies. So the, um, well, all right, so we lost a little bit. So this is, um, so I'll just skip that. Uh, so I'm going to first say a few words about structure prediction. Um, and uh, so for many years, we've been working on what is known as the ab initio structure prediction problem, where you're given the sequence of a protein, and you have to predict the structure, and you have no other information about structures of homologous proteins. So, um, and we sort of made slow progress over the years. Uh, but we were never able to accurately predict structures of proteins larger than 60 or 70 amino acids because there were too many possible confirmations. Well, that changed a couple of years ago, and um, this was sort of the, uh, the, the first demonstration of that. This is a prediction of structure prediction by Sergei Ovchinikov, a graduate student in the lab, who um, made a prediction in, in the CAF structure prediction experiment for the structure of a protein um, long before this crystal structure was, was made public. And when it was made public, um, it was found that these were very, very similar. And this was quite exciting um, for us because it was really the first time we could predict the structure of a, um, a complex protein accurately from sequence information alone. The way that Sergei did this is this protein belongs to a large protein family, so there were many sequences, and he could identify pairs of amino acids where there was evolutionary covariation and use this information to help guide the search. How many uh, This protein is, I think, about 300 amino acids. Um, so at that point, then, Sergei started building structures for many protein families, which were large protein families, for which there were no protein structures, and um, there were no representative known structures. And what I'm going to show you here is he published a paper with all these structures in them, and then subsequently uh, crystal structures were published. And so in these images, uh, Sergei's prediction is on the left, and the crystal structures are on the right. And you can see that in all these cases, the um, the predicted structures are very close to the crystal structures which were um, uh, published afterwards. And uh, this is also true for more complex structures made out of three chains. For example, this is Sergei's prediction, very similar to the uh, actual, to the crystal structure and so forth. Our, we're, we're kind of in the funny situation now where our biggest problem is not in, in computing these structures. I think in a way we've done what the Structural Genomics Initiative 
tried, wanted to do, which we can now compute structures for large, well, we can now determine structures for large protein families. They were planning to, they were doing it by um, experimental methods. It's really getting them out there because um, the, the PDB calls them models, and so um, we, 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 we don't know quite how to get them out to people. Um, all right, so, um, so now I'm going to switch to um, talk about protein design. I think the message there is that if you are working on proteins that um, come from large protein families and you want to know the structure, uh, let us know. Um, so in the protein design problem, rather than searching, having a fixed sequence and searching through possible structures, instead we have a fixed backbone and we want to find the sequence for which the uh, protein, for so such the sequence which has the lowest energy for that backbone. And coming back to my, what I was saying on the first slide, what I'm going to tell you about today is what we call de novo protein design that's making up brand new sequences from scratch, not starting with um, uh, sequences that are starting from naturally occurring protein families. So in this depiction, um, uh, this is all of sequence space, and these red uh, ovals depict naturally occurring protein families. And that, that uh, these red ovals are very much smaller than the overall gray space can be seen uh, simply uh, from the fact that since there's 20 amino acids and there's a typical protein might have 100 amino acids or more, uh, the number of po total possible sequences, 20 times 20, you know, to the 20 to the 100th power or greater, which is a, a really an astronomical number. And nature's only sampled a tiny, tiny fraction of this space. And so there's a lot of very, there's, there's a lot of room to, to explore here. Um, so uh, the first thing one of the first things that we, that we set out to do in thinking about how to explore the space is to think about uh, sequent pro relatively simple proteins which are just made by one repeating unit that repeats over and over and over again. And that's shown here. Sh examples are shown here. Of course, there are repeating proteins that many of you will be familiar with in nature. Um, uh, and we wanted to see whether that was really everything that all the types of repeat proteins that were possible or whether um, it was easy to come up with new ones. And, um, we ended up um, making a large number and uh, solving the crystal structures. Actually, Damon Eckyard and Gira Baba solved the crystal structures of 15 of these. More have been solved since. And you can see two things from this slide. First of all, the, crystal, the design models, the computational design models are in gray, and the crystal structures are in yellow. And you can see that they're very, very similar. So these, these brand new proteins can be designed quite accurately. The second is that the shapes of these proteins is really uh, quite different. So this one's very straight and untwisted. Here's a, here's a twisted one. Here's a curved one. And um, none of these proteins have any, sequ any sequence homology to any protein of known structure or any protein, any naturally occurring protein. So they're really brand new. The structural similarity where there is similarity is just over uh, two helix units, but the, none of the naturally occurring repeat proteins uh, really superimpose over that. So these different things you can think of like the connectors in a kid's toy. And um, what I'm going to tell you about at the end is, is my own project in trying to build things, build structures out of these by, by putting them together in different ways. Um, so um, up until recently, when we set out to design proteins, we were limited in that while we could, uh, while we could design on the computer tens or hundreds of thousands of sequences, or millions, we could only test a very small number. So we couldn't really, rigor we couldn't really figure out um, you know, what the determinants of, of success and, and failure in our design calculations were. I should say, I should emphasize that this, I'm going to show you mainly the successes in the designs where we, we, we made a synthetic gene encoding the new designed protein, and we expressed an E. coli, and the protein did not go to the bottom of the test tube or the bottom of the, and uh, refused to go into solution or not express at all. But there are, of course, many failures. And so we wanted to, do, to be able to do design on a scale where we could learn from the successes and failures. And we took advantage of recent advances in oligonucleotide synthesis. It's now possible to um, obtain uh, uh, hundreds of thousands of synthetic genes that are long enough to encode uh, a 40 or 60 residue protein. And in this first experiment, we chose to focus on the problem of protein stability of really minimal proteins, 40 or so amino acids. And there are very few proteins in nature which are stable without disulfide bonds or metal that are in this size range. So it's a pretty stringent test of the capability of um, being able to design new proteins. And Gabe Brocklin worked out a, a proteolysis on the yeast surface assay so he could figure out 
uh, we, we could make many, many designs. Then you could figure out which ones were stable and which ones weren't. Um, so in the first round, since these are really tiny proteins, uh, he made a large number of designs on the computer, uh, uh, ordered, made, obtained genes for a subset of them, and then tested them to see if they were stable. And only um, a, a small subset of them were stable in this first round. But then he was going to be able to take all the data that came back from this and learn what differentiated the stable ones from the unstable ones. And then he did a second round incorporating this knowledge into the computational model. And the success rate increased considerably. And this was true over four rounds until at the end, you can see the success rate, um, the fraction of design sequences that, that actually folded and were stable was really quite high. Um, and uh, um, Cheryl Aerosmith's lab solved the structure of a number of these proteins, and they came out very close to the design models. So we're quite confident that these, that these um, large numbers of proteins, design proteins, are folded as, um, as in the design. Um, but coming back to the theme on my first slide, uh, Gabe, at also, there aren't many proteins, as I said before, in this size range uh, with known structure. Um, and uh, without metals or, or, or disulfide bonds. And he synthesized genes for all of those, too. And he did the same kind of large-scale stability tests. So higher stability proteins are up here. Lower stability proteins are, out, are down here. And, you, and the colored bars indicate the design proteins just from this one experiment. And you can see that the number of, of, of stable proteins in this size range um, that are designed compared, to, that are designed really dwarfs the number that we know from from nature and from, st from structural biology. And I think this is sort of a, sort of a harbinger of the future because um, you can see that you know, the, the, no the, number of, the number of design structures is really greatly outpacing the number of um, naturally occurring structures in the size range. And I think this, this, this will continue over the years as we get better and better at designing proteins. I don't think it'll become rarer and rarer if you want to do something new in the protein space that you will start with something that exists rather than building it from scratch. So if we want to go smaller, thinking about therapeutics, for example, um, the, the, uh, we need to in, in, introduce uh, uh, constraints. For example, here I'm showing you cyclic peptides, circular peptides, where there's no beginning or end. The backbone closes on itself. Uh, so these structures are, um, are very stable. Uh, um, and what the NMR structures, these designs are stable. And you can see that here. They do not denature with temperature or, or chemically. And uh, they, um, the NMR structures are basically identical to the design models. Um, now, going still smaller, uh, this problem got very interesting to me because uh, you can actually, um, for in, 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 with proteins, you can never do comprehensive enumeration. There are too many states for, as I showed you, for a 100 amino acid protein, there's an astronomical number of sequences. But when you get down to a small cyclic peptide, the space suddenly becomes countable. And so we basically we used, we did a large scale enumeration of the different possible backbones that cyclic peptides made out of L and D amino acids could adopt, ranging from seven amino acids to 13 amino acids, and um, carry out the same kind of sequence design calculations, and identified about 250 macrocyclic structures um, which uh, macrocycle designs, which were predicted to fold into unique structures. Um, and of course, we couldn't experimentally test 250. Um, uh, we were able to experimentally test a number. I just want to emphasize that the, a really attractive feature about this problem is you can really achieve completeness. Um, and I'll show you now that uh, uh, we were able to solve structures of, of nine of these peptides, and they are shown um, here. We have a superposition of the NMR ensemble on the, um, on the design model in green. And you can see we can design these structures very accurately. This is not using the, the, the physics that's driving the folding process is somewhat different here. There's no hydrophobic core in these designs. Instead, instead they're held together by um, torsional restraints. You can see there's the, there are proline, reacher, re, uh, pro, proline residues, which are introducing kinks at key places in these, and uh, also by, by, by side chain and backbone hydrogen bonds. Um, and, uh, in these, in these sequences, which are a little bit hard to read, the capital letters are L amino acids and the lower letters are D amino acids. So this one turns out to be its own mirror image. It's all L. It's, it, it goes, um, well, you can just see from the sequence. Um, for getting larger, um, uh, going from 11 to 14 amino acids, 
uh, we need not only to have uh, cyclic peptides, but introduce additional disulfide constraints. And again, the NMR ensembles come out very similar to the design model. So these peptides are in just the size range of cyclosporin, which is a very powerful orally available drug. And, uh, and now we can design up, up until up until recently, really the only source of knowledge of these had been from natural products looking around in obscure places in nature. And now we can, um, we can design these types of structures. And cyclosporin, like I said, is, is orally available. So there's potential for these to get across membranes. And we're making considerable progress now in working out the rules, the design rules. How do we have to modify these peptides to make them f uh, freely go across membranes? And then, of course, that's very exciting because it opens up a whole new class of therapeutic targets. Now, thinking about um, targets, uh, we, um, we haven't done it. We're, what I'm going to show you now is going back to those 40 residue proteins that Gabe Rockland designed. And here we have, I'm showing you crystal structures of a design prote protein designed to bind the, to the influenza uh, surface protein, the influenza hemagglutinin, um, and a, a crystal structure superimposed on the design model. And you can see that um, the design is very, very close to the crystal structure. Um, and this is a similar design um, bound to the botulinum toxin. In this case, we did the same thing I described in the, in the previous, uh, with, the, with the small proteins in the previous experiment. We did a large scale, we tested many, many designs and iterated to learn the design rules to achieve high affinity and specific binding. So these small proteins have some interesting properties. You can heat them up for an extended period of time and they don't lose their binding activity, unlike an antibody against the flu, which rapidly decreases um, Act, loses activity when incubated at high temperature. Uh, one of the things that is going to come, become a recurrent theme in my talk is symmetry and modulating um, symmetric interactions. So what I was, and uh, this is a first example. So this is where the previous protein was binding in the stem region of the hemagglutinin. On the surface of the hemagglutinin, there's, there are three binding sites for sialic acid, which is how the flu virus gets into our cells. So um, Ava Strouch designed a small protein that bound to um, the uh, sialic acid binding site and then designed a, uh, built it into a symmetric trimer whose symmetry matches that of the top of the flu virus. So here's the sialic acid binding sites. Here's, the, here's the, the region of her design that binds in the sialic acid binding site. And you can see the symmetry is perfect so that this can sit down kind of in a trivalent way on top of the um, hemagglutinin. This protein since it's binding sort of threefold um, uh, valency, it doesn't come off um, the virus. We call this flu glue. Um, now, both of these proteins protect animals from the flu when their uh, animals are given the proteins either before um, or after uh, they're exposed to the virus. Um, and uh, whereas the animals who get the virus are very sick, those that um, get the protein either before or afterwards are, are, are protected. Um, so we can also design proteins against um, uh, human targets. And uh, this is a, design, a small design protein against the alpha V beta 6 integrin, which is, up, which is upregulated on many uh, tumors. Um, so here you see a mouse that has two tumors, one that's alpha V beta 6 positive and one that's not. And it's been, and we've simply added, this is actually done uh, in Jennifer Cochran's lab at Stanford. When we add this protein labeled, um, you can see it goes straight to the tumor and, um, and just stays there. <coughs> um, and it only goes to the alpha V beta 6 tumor. So um, we're excited now being able to target the drug, say, specifically to the tumor. Um, uh, another area for protein design is there nat nat in our bodies, there are natural hormones like cytokines, um, of which IL-2 is sort of the canonical member, which are, are um, complex proteins that um, have a wide variety of pharmacological properties. So what I'm showing here is the design sort of from, first, uh, from scratch of a protein which is a much simpler protein and preserves uh, two of the three binding interfaces in um, IL-2. Um, and the one it leaves, and it, so this way it can re achieve more selective binding. It only binds to the beta and gamma subunits of the IL-2 receptor, not the alpha subunit, which is expressed on regulatory T cells. This protein um, is very effective at binding to um, cells that just have the beta and gamma subunits. It binds much more tightly than just IL-2. And it's looking promising in tests for, um, uh, uh, well, it's at, for what it's worth, it's very good at 
curing mice of, of cancer. Whether it's going to be useful for more than that um, remains to be seen. Um, so I've talked all about, I've talked about binding proteins so far, and now I'm going to switch gears and talk about binding small molecules. So um, Anastasia Vorebyeva made a real breakthrough and discovered how to design all beta barrel, all beta proteins, like this beta barrel um, uh, from, from scratch. And Jai Dao, Dao took advantage of our understanding of the, pr the principles that Anastasia had, um, had uncovered to design beta barrels with a pocket that was the right size for binding the GFP chromophore. This is a crystal structure um, of, the, uh, of the design uh, bound to the GFP chromophore. This chromophore is not a fluorescent molecule unless held in the, in the planar conformation. You can see it's very planar in the design. The design, the, the crystal structure is nearly identical to the design model. You can see them overlaid here. Um, and this protein, the, 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 um, the small molecule becomes quite fluorescent when it's bound to the protein. And here you can see if you put this protein into <coughs> bacteria or yeast or, or mammalian cells, uh, you get uh, strong fluorescence. Um, and uh, it's interesting to compare this protein, which is this nice small protein designed from first principles with the sort of clunky Neanderthal protein found in a jellyfish called GFP. And um, you can see that this one is more than twice the size of this mini barrel. And uh, you can see the barrel is very much bigger. This is the, the nice, um, small, simple one. And also you can see that the chromophore is much more accessible to, uh, to the exterior. So for engineering various properties, it should be much more straightforward than it has been with, uh, with GFP. So, um, uh, yeah. So, okay. So now what I've talked about so far, while we are designing new proteins, the principles that we're designing with them, them with are largely similar to those uh, that are, we know of in native proteins. Um, but uh, uh, that's, there are other biomolecules which use different principles. For example, in uh, DNA, it's held together by Watson-Crick base pairing, um, hydrogen bond, modular hydrogen bonding um, through a central spine. And that's very, um, that's very powerful for achieving uh, specificity in a very simple way. So if you know the sequence of a DNA strand, it's trivial to write down the sequence of another strand that will bind to it with perfect complementarity. You just use Watson-Crick base pairing rules. So naturally occurring proteins don't work this way, but we wondered if we could design proteins that work this way. And uh, Scott Voiken developed a method for um, designing extended hydrogen bond networks. Um, in this example, this is a three hairpin uh, structure, that, and there's an extended hydrogen bond network um, uh, that is in, that's at this red layer and another one at this blue layer, and they are nearly um, identical in the design model and in the crystal structure, as you can see here. And um, so, you, so um, let's see. Uh, and so, in fact, we can use different networks at different layers of this structure and so achieve kind of the combinatorial digital specificity you can achieve with DNA by simply placing different networks at different layers, we can uh, get different specificities. Um, so we can take advantage of these, um, of these uh, hydrogen bond networks to stabilize uh, de novo design proteins in membranes. So this is a uh, crystal structure of a membrane protein that um, Pei Long Lu designed uh, that, um, and the overlay between the crystal structure and the design model, one's in blue and one's in green, they're very, very close. This protein is expressed in E. coli, goes to the plasma membrane, and then Pei Long solubilizes it in detergent. and um, uh, and, um, extra and, pure and purifies it and solves the structure. We also have made larger proteins with big pores. Um, we've had a really good uh, collaboration with Du Yongmin and Jim Bowie here um, on, um, on I, I'm sorry, I should, that was, um, on, they did some very beautiful pooling experiments on this protein and found that it was really exceptionally stable. Um, Pei Long also designed this, this very, com this quite complex <laughs> protein. It's a, it's a eight helix bundle. Here's the eight helices here. This is the membrane spanning part here. And uh, this, is the, um, uh, this is the design model. And this is the crystal structure. And you can see they're very, very similar. Uh, here's an overlay down here. Um, and uh, so this protein, it looks sort of like a frog or a rocket, depending on how you look at it. It, it doesn't do anything yet. But you can see there's a lot of opportunities for engineering and developing pores. So we're now 
trying to use this approach to design channels of different sorts. So coming back to the specificity, this DNA-like specificity, um, I'm going to, here, here we have um, uh, heterodimers that designed by Zebo Chen and Scott Boykin, and you can see they're held together by, uh, by now asymmetric hydrogen bond networks because we're trying to make heterodimers where there's interactions between two different chains. Um, and uh, Zebo recently got a crystal structure of one of these, and again, the hydrogen bond networks are pretty well recapitulated. So Vicky Waisaki, who uh, at uh, OSU, um, did this really, and Zebo did this really quite remarkable experiment. So Zebo purified um, a number of these heterodimers, designed heterodimers, and then sent them to Vicky's lab, and Vicky's lab denatured them, so all these components are now free, and then allowed them to renature, and then did native mass spectrometry to look what was present. And the rather remarkable thing is Zebo's design 9B only was found in complex with 9A, not with anything else, and that was true all the way through. So each, each, um, each monomer only bound its design cognate monomer and not anything else. And so this is starting to achieve specificity like we have with DNA, whereas if you took uh, many different duplexes, denatured them, they would reanneal and reform the original duplexes. Um, Sherry uh, Bermio has done the same thing with heterotrimers. So now there's a more complex network involving three different chains. When she has, if she has a tag on one of them and purifies the, the trimer, she gets three bands. They all co-purify. And then, again, Vicky's lab has done native mass spectrometry. And of all the different things that you could, you could find, the only thing that they observe is the three-chain structure. So, um, so we can design, so there, there are, as far as applications, there's a lot of interesting synthetic biology applications of the heterodimers. I'm going to show you in my own project how we're, how we're using these heterodimers and heterotrimers now to build more complex materials in just a moment. Um, so now I'm going to talk, talk about using these networks to achieve uh, dynamic properties. Everything I've talked about so far is static. So these structures, these proteins are folding to lowest energy states, but they don't move. They don't respond to their environment. So Scott Boykin uh, designed uh, this trimer that's held together by an extensive hydrogen bond network that's made out of histine residues, which of course get protonated below pH 6.5. And, and once they get protonated, there's electrostatic repulsion, and so this whole network gets disrupted. So he sent this design to Vicky's lab, and it's a perfect trimer down to pH 6. Um, below pH 6, these histines start getting protonated, and very rapidly the trimer starts disappearing. And then at low pH, one only finds the monomer. Scott can tune the pH at which this transition happens by, by varying the, the number of the, the these, these designs have, the first one I showed you had three um, hyd uh, histine hydrogen bond network layers. This is the crystal structure. You can see it comes out exactly like the design model. The density, this is the design model and the density. And, um, uh, but there's other layers, these black layers, which are all hydrophobic. So if Scott uses more of these layers, then the, set, the, the pH, this pH of this transition moves to higher pH, whereas if there are more hydrophobic layers, the protein becomes more, more stable and, very, and one needs to go to much lower pH to, um, uh, to get the thing to come apart. So we can not only achieve um, uh, environmental control, but we can modulate it very precisely. And this protein has um, uh, not only has, as I showed you, not only has polar residues, but also has hydrophobic residues. When this is added to membranes that are filled with a vesicles that are filled with a fluorescent dye, at pH 7, uh, nothing happens. But as the pH uh, drops below 7, um, the dye comes rushing out of the liposome. Because this protein is probably something like the influenza hemagglutinin. It comes apart at pH 7 and then inserts into membranes. And so we're very excited about this um, for uh, addressing the problem of endosomal escape. How do you get proteins out of the endosome? We're working on that now. So in a second example of dynamic proteins, I'm going to now talk about sort of a, a, a primitive example of allosteric. So here, uh, Bobby Langan, working with Scott, has uh, taken the, um, this, this is now another one of the helical bundles that's held together by hydrogen bond networks. And he's embedded within it a peptide that binds a target. This is BCL2 involved in apoptosis. So this protein cannot bind the target at all because this peptide motif is locked in in this cage. It's caged. And so 
if you have this target on the surface and you add the blue protein, you get absolutely no binding at all. If you add this short key, um, that's this line here, you also get no binding. Um, if you add the medium key, you get some binding. And if you add this long key, then you get binding at relatively low concentration of key. So we're adding the key in, and we're getting binding. But the key is not binding to the target. The key is displacing the, what we call the latch from the cage so that it can be now be free to bind the target. Um, so Bobby has used the same type of hydrogen bonding logic to make orthogonal latch key systems. So this just shows that um, there are, this is different networks and different latch, key latch uh, designs, and again, that they're orthogonal. Um, so Hannah El Samad's lab has shown that these lock key systems work inside cells. So here we have a transcription factor that um, has this cage with, instead of a BCL2 binding peptide, it has a degron, a sequence which uh, causes uh, degradation. So in the absence of the key, this transcription factor induces transcription. Um, when the key is expressed separately, um, the amount of transcription factor decreases. That's along this axis, more and more key because uh, it, it binds to the cage, exposing the key, the degron, which then leads to degradation. And so where we're going with this is to uh, try and address the problem of, of tumor, recognizing tumors and other types of cells, immune cells, that don't really have a single unique marker on their surface, but have, have two or three markers that are only found in combination on the tumor, but never in, but, um, uh, and, but are occur individually or, say, in pairs on other types of cells. And the basic idea, this is using one of the header trimers and the lock, on the lock key system. We only get exposure of an epitope that would, say, recruit a CAR T cell or an antibody drug conjugate if all these three markers are present. Um, so, we're, um, show this. so now I'm going to, in the last part of my talk, uh, discuss self-assembly. And um, here I'm showing you a, one of those repeat proteins I talked about at the beginning that we could design from scratch. And we, here we've designed an interface into them, that into one of them, such that it assembles into helical filaments, which are shown here. And we can ex increase the width of the filaments just by increasing the number of repeats. Um, and here we have an E. coli cell that's about 10 microns long that's, ex that's expressing one of the fibers and getting stretched way out. Um, so uh, Justin Coleman, so this is work by Hao Shen, and uh, Eric Lynch and Justin Coleman's lab has now solved structures of six of these by design fibers by cryo-electron microscopy. Um, and here the design models are in um, uh, gray, and the, the, the structures are in blue. You can see they're really quite close, and that we have quite a few different morphologies um, that uh, uh, fibers. So one of, there are a variety of applications of these. One is to, um, you know, Todd, Todd has done really um, beautiful work in showing that you can solve structures by scaffolding. And these fibers provide another way of scaffolding a protein you want to solve the structure of. And here you would have helical symmetry that you could use. Um, so uh, that was in one dimension. Now in two dimensions, uh, we can, um, this is an example. Here we have a magenta protein and a green protein that when you mix them together or um, or express them both in E. coli, form this extended hexagonal lattice, uh, which, um, uh, and again, um, Justin's lab has solved the structure by, um, and you see it here, it overlaps almost exactly with the computational design model. Um, so in a, in a really great collaboration with Tamir Gonin and uh, Todd, um, uh, Neil King, working with Jacob Bale in the lab, uh, designed these uh, two component icosahedra, and these are images that uh, Shane Gonan took of these, these designs. There are two components when um, and one of them has a his tag on them. They're both expressed in the same time in E. coli, and you get these very beautiful homogeneous populations. And Todd's, uh, Todd's lab solved the crystal structures of three of these, and you can see they come out really close to the design models. Um, and this was really exciting for us because these have hundreds of thousands of heavy, at heavy atoms. They're multiple megadaltons. And they were really designed fundamentally with the same methods that we use to design those little cyclic peptides of eight or nine amino acids. And these are beautiful images that Shane and Tamir took of. These are averages of the particles compared to um, uh, computational models. 
So Neil King set up his own lab at the University of Washington. One of the many interesting things he's doing is, um, is developing these um, as vaccines. So here's the basic idea. You take the, um, icosahedron, one of the icosahedron nanoparticles and you put on its surface a viral glycoprotein and here are some images of these viral glycoproteins on these uh, particles. Um, and this shows um, some very exciting data uh, with, um, from Antonio Lanzavecchia's lab working in collaboration with Neil. Um, just look over here. So this is the DSCAV1 is a stabilized version of the respiratory syncytial virus surface protein, which is the leading vaccine candidate for respiratory syncytial virus, which is a serious disease for infants and the elderly. Um, so it produces a modest, um, sorry, it's this one here, a modest uh, uh, neutralizing response. But when it's put on the particle, um, the response is about tenfold higher. And this is true all the way from uh, mice up to primates. There's this huge boost in immunogenicity. And uh, so we're very excited to see if this can, um, can be a, is a viable um, and potent vaccine against RSV in humans. Um, so now briefly about what, what I've been doing. Um, one of the things that uh, Neil and I are very excited about now is to make still larger particles that um, could be uh, for universal flu vaccines, where you could put multiple different hemagglutinins on at multiple distinct sites. And we can take advantage. Um, you can see where we've been going. We have the repeat proteins, which are like connectors. We have the heterotrimers that I mentioned um, Sherry had been making, and the heterodimers that uh, Zebo had been making. And if we, we can now use these to build much more complicated structures, um, and this shows, sort of shows a building block. Um, so we, and then this is the way in which we're hoping to be able to make a universal flu vaccine. So I've been, I, and so I get to connect what a lot of people in the lab have been doing. And, um, oops, oh, this may not work, let's see. Okay, well, you don't get to see the, I, was, I get to see the movies of my designs. But these are basically made by connecting um, uh, repeat proteins in those helical bundles um, in various ways. And one can build up very elaborate structures without ever really having to design any new interfaces. Okay, so the final thing um, which I wanted to tell you about is um, I've made a big emphasis on design so far, but in some cases where we don't understand the basic principles, we can use selection too. So we were interested in, in, in making these particles encapsulate their own genomes, um, like primitive viruses. So here we're co-expressing um, the two components on one RNA, uh, and um, we've modified the interior of the particle so that it can capture its own message. Um, we then grow these up, we can harvest the particles, and then treat them in a variety of ways, select for the ones that survive, and then go back and basically evolve by selection uh, different properties. Um, and uh, the properties we tried to evolve were first just packaging of the RNA itself. We were able, after just a couple rounds of evolution, to greatly increase the amount of RNA packaging up to the level in, um, in uh, AAV vectors. And then uh, lifetime in, in blood and protection against ribonuclease. And then finally, um, uh, the, um, uh, the final selection was for particles that could, could circulate for large, long lengths of time in an animal. And you can see that um, this, this final design we made was, um, was stable for a very long time in circulation, much, much longer than uh, any of the um, previous generations. And when we look where those particles are going, um, in the, uh, the original particle disappears very rapidly from the body, appears in the liver, whereas these, um, these extended, these particles that we've evolved now go all over the body. And so we're now very excited about being able to use this to target different tissues, again, for uh, cancer applications. All right, so <laughs> what you've all been waiting for, um, uh, I have to thank Amanda's friend Julia for helping me choose this picture at about midnight last night. So I hope I've showed you um, that we now understand the fundamentals of protein folding and assembly and that we can build a whole new world of um, synthetic proteins. And, um, and well, I can just keep it up here for a while. So <laughs> <laughs> I might get in trouble later. Um, oh, one more thing is not only can we design proteins, but we've enabled the general public to design proteins. So we've started this, we have started this game a while ago, protein structure prediction and design game. And, um, um, called Foldit, and Foldit players the last year or two have been challenged with a puzzle where they have an extended chain, they have to fold up basically by hand into a structure and then design a sequence. My student, student Brian Kuip has been um, 
uh, actually so convinced by these designs. He's made a number of them and solved structures now of three of them. They come out very similar to the design models. So we now understand the rules of protein folding well enough to have uh, total non-experts um, design proteins that can fold. So I've had a number of, a large number of really fantastic colleagues and collaborators. Um, so Sergei of Chinnikov, Humboldt Park, and Frank DeMaio really did the work that led to the breakthrough in protein structure prediction I talked about at the beginning. The design of the repeat protein building blocks was done by TJ, Posso, and Fabio. Um, uh, the design of the mini proteins, Gabe Rothland did the design of the design for stability, and Aaron and Daniel designed the binding proteins. Uh, the, the membrane protein design work was done by Pei Long Lu, again in collaboration with, uh, with Jim and Du Young here. Um, the cyclic peptides, the Gaurav and Vikram designed the, the first larger ones, the circular ones, and then the 7 to 11 residue ones it was worked by Parisa Hosenzade and Gaurav um, and Vikram and Tim working together. I'm not supposed to call it that, but the design of the synthetic virus was done by Gabe and Mark. Um, and the hydrogen bond network work was done by Scott uh, Zebo and Chun Fu designed those membrane pores, the larger ones. Uh, the design of the beta barrels and the fluorescent protein was done by Anastasia Vorobieva and uh, Jai Dao. And uh, Neil King really brought the whole icosahedral, the whole self-assembly um, design to my lab. He's worked with, with uh, Todd um, here as a graduate student. Um, Jacob Bale did the work on the, um, on the two-component icosahedra. And uh, Shane um, and Tamir did the beautiful structural biology I, I showed you. Um, uh, um, uh, Ariel designed the 2D layers, how designed the 1D fibers. And we've had a large number of really fantastic collaborators, as mentioned. So I'd be happy to take questions. 